From New York City, for our viewers worldwide, I'm Lisa Abramowitz in for Jonathan Farrow, starting 2Q with a softer tone. The Nasdaq down about seven tenths of a percent ahead of the open. The countdown to the open starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. Coming up, OPEC's surprise production cut fueling inflation concerns, sending Treasury yields higher and big tech stocks lower as layoffs continue, with UBS said to be joining the list. We begin with the big issue, Q2 getting underway. This is sort of the start of a new quarter. This year has all been about the whipsaw. The volatility that we saw in two-year yields. Two-year yields went from five to four, and 10-year yields went from four to three and a half. It's uh, it's whiplash. I think the market is telling you that investors are starting to, you know, exhale a bit. We've had a series now of, of problems. Three banks uh, having been uh, shot uh, in the U.S. Not only do you have the banking crisis that's weighing on confidence. When you think about the Fed and all of these, you know, they've still got a big inflation problem. These crises just push us off kilter and make it very difficult to get back to where we need to. We need to wait and see that. The outlook is optimistic, but a little bit cautious. I'd rather be a little late to the party than get there early and not have anything there. Joining us now, Morgan Stanley, Sri Sankarin, and Kathy Jones of Charles Schwab. This has been the big question. Here we are embarking on another quarter. Kathy, what has gotten clear in the past three months? Uh, very little, <laughs> other than I think that the you know the Fed has still uh, continued to ratchet up rates despite problems in the banking center. So I I think that the um, the only clarity we have is that the reaction function remains pretty strong, and it's going to take a lot for them not to hike rates again in May. Um, that being the case, uh, we think that that will be the end of the cycle in terms of the peak in rates. But I think what we have seen is that. Uh, the Fed is still really focused on inflation, even at the expense of um, slowing growth and the problems in, in the banking system. Shree, from your vantage point, what has changed with your Q2 outlook from Q1 in terms of your baseline, in terms of your uh, main assumptions? Yeah, I mean, I would say a couple of things which we're watching closely when we're looking at how Q2 could differ from Q1. One is the the transition from inflation and rates volatility to the concerns around growth, I think that pass through or transition has become kind of more imminent, so to speak, as we progress. And the second aspect of it is that the Fed was doing the heavy lifting with respect to the rate hikes and tightening of financial conditions. But what's changed over the past month, which translates into what, what the outlook for Q2 is going to be, is about credit markets and bank lending. That's what we are going to watch in terms of the, the tightening of credit conditions as we go ahead. We're going to build on that coming up. In the meantime, uh, Kathy was mentioning the Fed, which has another hike in the pipeline. That's the take as well, not only from Kathy, but also St. Louis Fed President Jim Bullard. Bloomberg's Michael McKee caught up with him in an exclusive interview just moments ago. Take a listen. The median person on the committee says uh, a little over 5 percent. I'm a little higher than that. Um, I think inflation will be stickier. You're really not seeing much ebbing uh, in the labor market. And uh, oil prices fluctuate around. It's hard, to, it's hard to track exactly. Some of that might feed into inflation and make our job a little bit more difficult. Mike joins us now. And Mike, we did hear Jim Bullard say the market should be listening to me. He has a different view than some in the market. Yes, he thinks that inflation is going to be stickier than uh, many of his colleagues do. And he's also worried about what might happen with uh, the economy and uh, inflation w wages and inflation because the labor market is still so tight. So he suggests that, uh, as you pointed out, the markets listen to him and he's at 5.6 uh, percent, which would require another three moves by the Fed to get to what Jim Bullard thinks is restrictive. But he did uh, admit there's a lot of uncertainty out there and there's no reason to make a decision if you're the Fed until you get right up to the next meeting, which is May 3rd. Which is the reason why a lot of people are pricing them uh, out pretty much and even rate cuts. Michael McKee, wonderful work. Thank you so much for that interview. Sri Sankaran and Kathy Jones still with us. Sri, given the fact that you're looking 
at tightening in lending standards, could the Fed raise rates one, two, even three more times this year? Our house call is for potentially one more rate hike. And then again, the, the June hike is probably a question mark. We don't, we're not kind of basing that, we're not maybe including that in our base case. But at the end of the day, I think some of the comments that uh, Chair Powell made during the last press conference do suggest that they are cognizant of the fact that the change in funding conditions for banks, specifically the regional banks, which are important in the context of lending to certain asset classes like commercial real estate and CNI, that does mean that some of the, the, the hikes which the Fed would have otherwise considered may be uh, kind of transmitted through by the markets and the tightening of bank lending conditions and credit conditions rather than the Fed doing the, the work there. Kathy, do we have any indication of this, this sort of expected tightening in lending that will offset the need for a greater degree of rate hikes? Well, we've already seen, as, as you've referred to many times, that senior uh, lending officers survey that was tightening uh, in lending standards even before the problems developed uh, with the regional banks. I would expect that that will continue. Uh, we've seen, you know, the high yield market kind of closed up for a couple of weeks. Now it seems to be coming back, but there really wasn't much activity there during that uh, that you know that whole disruption in the banking sector. So I do think we're seeing lending standards tighten. I do think that, and particularly in some of the, the smaller um, business loan categories, uh, that will probably see banks get more cautious about it. So I, I think we're seeing it. It's just not filtering through uh, in a big way yet to slowing growth enough to get inflation where the Fed wants it to be. Kathy, does that change your view at all in order to uh, basically get to that lower inflation? Does that make you think that we need higher rates for longer? No, we don't. Um, so our view is one more rate hike. Uh, the Fed's plan, as they've laid it out, is to hold for the rest of the year. We think that that's pretty optimistic on that part. On their part. I do think at least one rate cut before uh, the end of the year in 2023 and some more into 2024. So we're seeing slowing growth, we're seeing ebbing inflation, uh, we're seeing wage growth slow down. And I think that all the, and now tightening financial conditions, all that adds up to a slower economy in the second half and the likelihood that the Fed will probably have to ease somewhere down the road. And this whole idea of disinflation was really fueled by much lower energy prices. Until the weekend, when OPEC Plus delivered a surprise production cut, slashing supply by more than 1 million barrels a day and reviving the case, at least to some, for triple-digit uh, crew. Joining us now, Bloomberg's uh, Julian Lee from London. Julian, how significant and how unusual was the production cut that we got yesterday? Um, it was unusual. I mean, it was unusual uh, largely because of the way in which it was done, which was uh, without any meeting, without any real forewarning, There'd been talk back in uh, late January, early February, around the time that the uh, group's monitoring committee last met, uh, that there might be an output cut coming, and, and it didn't happen. Um, so this is clearly something that's, that's been kicking around within the OPEC Plus group for um, a couple of months. Nonetheless, uh, all the um, guidance leading up to the meeting that actually took place uh, earlier today was that OPEC would hold steady uh, or the OPEC plus group would hold steady. So this has come as a surprise to the market. And a lot of people are seeing this as a potential for upward surprises to the price of oil. Julian Lee, thank you so much for all your reporting, and I'm sure it will continue throughout the day and weeks to come. Sri Sankaran and Kathy Jones, so with us, Sri, from your vantage point, how much does this potential cut, or a million barrels uh, that the OPEC plus group is going to be executing, how much does that change the narrative for you? I mean, in the very near term, obviously, it does add to some of the, the inflation pressures or uncertainty around the, the Fed response function. But I would say that uh, over the medium term, it does feel like this has a flavor of a potential OPEC put of sorts in the sense that they're trying to get ahead of more recession fears being baked in by the market. So it does set a bit more of a floor to prices rather than translate into a much more bullish signal over the medium term. But our kind of house call has been from Martin Ratz and team, our oil strategist, has been much more close to the kind of the, the mid to high 90s is what we're calling for into year end. And this was before the, the OPEC cut. 
So clearly some of the downside risk to the forecast were building before the, the recent announcement. And I would say that that takes away some of the downside risk rather than create much more upside. But I mean, obviously these are very recent developments. So we will be continuing to watch the, uh, the price action as we go through the day and the weeks. Sri, when you take a look at uh, this from a credit perspective, are higher oil prices disinflationary or inflationary? That's a good one. I would say that uh, I mean holding ranges is prob at these levels is probably a good thing for credit because there were two specific sectors of the market that credit investors were most, let's say, constructive on or overweight on going into this year. One was financials, the other was energy. Clearly, the whole fin the confidence in the financial sector was shaken a little bit by the developments of March. And the, some of the, the risk to the downside, which we're building with respect to energy, that would have translated into more negative price action for the other big sector overweight for the credit investors. So to some extent, I would say that the recent developments is probably going to uh, kind of improve the outlook for some of the pockets of the credit market that investors are overweight. But clearly, we don't want to see too much of this shock because then the macro side of the signal starts to matter much more. Right now, it's a micro positive, macro question mark. Kathy, from your vantage point, how do you view oil as a signal of uh, whether it's inflationary, disinflationary, or neutral? Yeah, I mean, I think that obviously top line inflation picks up when we see oil prices go up, but we're really focused more on the core. And I would say at this stage of the game uh, that it's more probably long term disinflationary. So OPEC. Plus wouldn't have done this if demand had been strong. So clearly demand is already too soft. Um, and the fear is that it softens further in the global economy because of all the rate hikes and the cumulative impact of central bank tightening. So I'm not sure that it's, uh, it's anything more than a signal of concerns about slowing global economic growth. But I think domestically, when we look at it, we're already seeing uh, an overburdened consumer to some extent with very high credit card rates, high uh, loan rates on autos. We're starting to see some pickup there in default rates. So I think it's more disinflationary because it simply takes money out of the pocket of consumers uh, that might have been spent elsewhere in the economy. Kathy, you said that we're already seeing uh, spending drop off. And I know that peripheral Citigroup, for example, Bank of America credit card surveys are highlighting a little bit of this on the edges. How much can you make of that? I mean, is this truly the sort of disinflationary force that people have been waiting for? Well, I think it's more of a return to the mean. You know, we've had very strong nominal spending in the economy now ever since we came out of the pandemic and what it may be what we are picking up the signals are that it is slowing down both in nominal and real terms so i think that that's worthwhile keeping an eye on you know when we looked at those fourth quarter gdp numbers we saw real consumption start to fall off so i think that that ends up being more of a disinflationary story in the second half of the year uh, than currently with the jump in oil prices. Sri, your view on how consumer spending is evolving currently and likely to? Yeah, I mean, I would agree with some of the points that Kathy made there, right? So the medium term, it does add to some of the changes in consumption patterns specifically. Our econ team, uh, Ellen Zentner and team, have been talking about the potential mix shift in terms of consumer patterns, i.e. kind of uh, reducing, not just not specifically reducing spend, but effectively shifting away from discretionary and services oriented spend to non discretionary side of spend. So that effectively is what we're watching out in terms of the, the consumer patterns. It's not like a, a massive shock to the consumer just yet, but it does kind of accelerate some of this mix shift effects that we've been focused on. Sri Sankaran, Kathy Jones, both of you are staying with us. Coming up, more layoffs underway. The Federal Reserve is themselves. Their unemployment forecast suggests that we're going to get some negative payrolls, perhaps losing three, four hundred thousand jobs between March and, and the end of the year. So, yeah, I think that's likely. McDonald's and UBS said to be the latest to plan more job cuts. That conversation coming up next. We're going to get some negative payrolls, perhaps losing three, four hundred thousand jobs between March and, and the end of the year. So, yeah, I think that's likely. We can see this coming. We've got the, the credit tightening.
Yeah. It's going to be particularly affecting the small business sector, and that is going to slow the economy. And, and we, we can see it all over the place. Companies around the world continuing to tighten their belt with more job cuts in the pipeline. McDonald's becoming the latest to make a move. The Wall Street Journal reporting that the fast food giant is sending staff home to deliver layoffs virtually. And across the Atlantic, UBS looking to slash its workforce by up to 30 percent after the Credit Suisse takeover. A Swiss newspaper reporting that it could mean as many as 36,000 cuts worldwide. For more, uh, joining us now is Bloomberg Shanali Basik as well as Abigail Doolittle in New York. Uh, Shanali, I want to start with you. Uh, with UBS, what have we learned about where these job cuts are going to focus? Listen, Lisa, we know that when it comes to mergers and acquisition, a key tenant is synergies, which means job cuts come underway for roles that have duplications. Remember, Credit Suisse did not have a huge U.S. wealth manager, but these two companies have humongous wealth managers worldwide. UBS will be looking to retain the best of the best, while you have Deutsche Bank, Citigroup, J.P. Morgan, certain banks planning to pause their hiring pauses here to bring more people on in this war for talent as things start to shake out. But to the point that you're making here, the market cannot absorb all of these jobs. UBS and Credit Suisse combined would make one of the largest banks in Europe by headcount. That is 123 thousand people combined, UBS being the larger of the two firms. And remember, investment banking jobs here are also likely to be cut as UBS streams line, streamlines that investment bank and looks to maintain profitability there. Again, 36,000 jobs. Credit Suisse had a plan to cut 9,000 over time. This would go well above and beyond that for both firms. Yeah, tripling them. And there's a question of how heavily they're going to weight that to the Credit Suisse side rather than the UBS side. Meanwhile, over in the consumer facing sector, McDonald's Donald's Abigail sending home to do it virtually. Please explain. It is really a pretty interesting situation here, Lisa, and it's a well communicated layoff because back in January they did talk about difficult decisions ahead uh, relative to staffing levels as they're trying to make changes for their chain overall. An email last week went out to U.S. corporate staff along with some international corporate staff saying Monday through Wednesday, please work from home. We are going to be making these layoffs virtually. Now it's not clear how many folks will be laid off. They do have more than 150. 50,000 uh, corporate staff around the world. Now, they've been making layoffs since 2018. This could be one reason why the S&P 500 has underperformed McDonald's over the last year. Back in 2019, they had more than 200,000 employees, corporate staff. So again, reduced by almost 50,000 over that time period. So some investors may think that this company is dealing with it better. And speaking of dealing with it better, Lisa, obviously McDonald's is joining UBS. Uh, there's so many companies laying folks off as we come out of the pandemic, inflation, Amazon, FedEx, Disney, GM, just to name a few. McDonald's, the latest. It will be interesting to see how many folks are laid off from those more than 150,000 corporate staff uh, worldwide and what the impact is. Abigail, Shanali, both of you, thank you so much for that. Street Sankarin and Kathy Jones still with us. The year of efficiency, we heard that from Meta and we continue to see that. Sri, how do you determine whether this is really just getting rid of extra fat versus cutting the bone? in the face of a real margin squeeze and potentially economic softness. I think some of it you would see in terms of the, the nature of job cuts being uh, announced, right? So I mean, to the extent that these are large tech companies or some of the, the larger consumer names that you were just talking about, I mean, it does feel like that could be, uh, to some extent, the, the excess labor force being trimmed. But to the extent that you see those job cuts start to transmit more meaningfully into the, the smaller companies and small and mid-sized companies, I think that's where it becomes clear that this is the, the credit tightening and the access to liquidity and some of the, the kind of more adverse side of the credit conditions doing the, uh, the, the or catalyzing these job losses rather than just trimming of excess labor force here. Would you but I think a couple of things there, oh, sorry, go on. No, no, please continue. Now, I was just going to say that the tension here is between the thesis that companies would still have to hold labor because of the experience of COVID versus kind of prioritizing survival and liquidity in an environment where credit availability is squeezed much more significantly. It's not clear which is going to overweigh, which was going to be the, the heavier, uh, doing the heavier lift here. But our house call is for a little over 4%. So not a material increase in unemployment rate because it's still the holding thesis that we're saying will dominate. 
Sorry, I was just overexcited by what you had just said, and I'd love to get Kathy's view on that. This question of the job cuts that we're hearing announced, a direct consequence of the credit tightening that we're seeing on the part of banks. Kathy, would you agree with that assessment? Well, I think that's part of it, but I think we're also, if you look back, the Fed's been tightening for well over a year now at a really rapid rate to slow down the demand side of the economy and rebalance the labor market. And I think the outcome that we're seeing now is that companies that had expanded very sharply during the post-pandemic uh, time period, with the reopening time period, are starting to dial back. But also seeing that you know demand on the ground is slowing, and that means slower growth, particularly for some of the high-flying companies. And as they lay off, um, that has a ripple effect throughout the rest of the economy. So we do think it will filter down into smaller and medium-sized businesses that have actually been doing pretty well. Uh, that's where the job growth has been heavily concentrated, and we think that that slows down materially in the second half, more because of the, the cumulative tightening we've seen from the Fed than just the, the tightening in financial conditions in the last couple of months. Sri, at what point, given that you and Kathy seem to be uh, in agreement with a lot of this, do you see a potential buying opportunity for riskier credit again? I mean, how far away are we from that if you still see so much pain still yet to be worked through the system? I mean, that is going to be a question of two things, right? So one, with respect to the economy, I mean, clearly the, the risk is that you do see a more pronounced kind of a, a, a a recession set up going into the back half of the year. That's not what our base case is, but to the extent that some of these kind of adverse extraneous factors contribute to that, that means that you still want to buy time. And that's kind of where we are now. And the second aspect of it is just the valuation side of the story, right? So we did see some degree of decompression within the credit market. Some of the lower quality portions of the market start to sell off more meaningfully, but that was as short-lived as ever. So in the past week, again, we've seen some degree of a snap back and some of the, the financial repricing obviously confined more to the regional smaller bank space, et cetera. We don't want to see more of that valuation story get favorable and the market start to reflect or price in more of the recession risk because that's kind of changed over the past week, but valuations of the past month, but valuations haven't really moved as much. Sri Sankar and Kathy Jones, both of you, thank you so much for being with us this morning. Coming up, the morning calls and later, an unforgiving earnings season. Why Chris Harvey of Wells Fargo thinks results that miss could lead to bigger punishments. That conversation around the opening bell. Time now for our morning calls. We'll look at some of the analyst recommendations on Wall Street this morning. First up, Bernstein upgrading Intel to market perform, saying the macro setup is finally starting to improve. Next up, JP Morgan upgrading Macy's to overweight, highlighting the stock's favorable risk reward at current levels. And finally, Morgan Stanley downgrading first solar to underweight, seeing limited upside with benefits from the Inflation Reduction Act already priced into shares. This is Bloomberg. Countdown to the open, and Lisa Abram was in for Jonathan Farrow. Starting the next quarter with perhaps a bit of softness, you're seeing the Nasdaq leading the declines lower, seven tenths of a percent. Uh, S&P off to by just a tenth of a percent. Really, the Russell 2000 gaining about a quarter, given the fact a quarter of a percent, given the fact that uh, the small regional and bigger banks are all doing well, given the fact that we did not get any news over the weekend about banking crises, so perhaps banking crisis over. In the other space, we're seeing yields higher on the heels perhaps of what happened with OPEC plus cutting production by more than a million barrels, crude prices up, up by more than 5%, almost 6% on the NYMEX. Same with uh, what you're seeing over in with respect to crude and a little bit of dollar weakness pretty much across the board. OPEC really leading the charge this morning, delivering a surprise production cut as Q2 gets underway, setting crude prices higher, which we just saw, sparking a rally as well in energy stocks following 
somewhat brutal month uh, for the sector that we just saw. For more, mm -hmm. Abigail Doolittle. Abby. Yeah, big, big gains there, uh, Lisa, for some of the big oil companies today. And it's interesting because oil, you were mentioning the rough month. It's actually been a rough five months for oil, down five months in a row, the longest losing streak since for oil going back to 2015. As traders really assess what's going on coming out of the pandemic, of course, we had that supernatural rise, uh, plus the inflation pressures. But right now, oil is, of course, popping up more than about $5 for both WTI and Brent crude. And technically, we have oil set to go back toward $90. This is a very reliable range. Oil now back above its $50-day uh, moving average, going toward the uh, yellow 200-day moving average. That's a fancy way of saying the long-term traders may get more reinvigorated here. In fact, some analysts are saying that because of this OPEC Plus cut, that it puts $100 per barrel back on the table, as we saw last year. Now, interestingly, even as we've had oil on the decline over the last several months, that has not been the case for big oil. Some of these companies really figuring out how to manage it. If oil does increase, Lisa, it seems pretty clear that it could go right to the bottom line of some of these big companies. One reason that we do have some of these big oil names higher and energy right now up 3%, the best sector on the day. Abby, thank you so much. Meanwhile, over in the merger sector, you're seeing uh, something different for WWE, that is World Wrestling Entertainment. Shares falling after Endeavor struck a $9 billion deal to buy the firm. The CEO is saying, quote, given the incredible work that Endeavor has done to grow the UFC brand, this is without a doubt the best outcome for shareholders. Let's bring in Bloomberg's Katie Greifeld for more, evidently the WWE expert. <laughs> Katie, uh, why is this not perhaps getting the most enthusiastic response from shareholders? Well, Lisa, let me just start and say that this is huge news in the world of televised combat entertainment, which I learned a lot about this morning. <laughs> so the combined company, it's going to be valued at more than $21 billion. And like you said, Vince McMahon came out and said, this is without a doubt the best outcome. But you do see shares falling right now, currently off about 7% or so because a counter offer is seen as unlikely. Those are the words of Wells Fargo. So that could explain the reaction that you're seeing in the shares. Let's get into the numbers though. Endeavor is going to control 51% of this new company and Ari Emanuel will take over as the CEO of that new company. And this deal, it values WWE at about $9.3 billion. Wells Fargo again said that the reported bid implies an offer price of about $102 per share, which WWE, WWE E, it's never seen that number. If you look at a long-term chart of this stock, the all-time high is just below $100. That was reached in April 2019, and we had been getting closer. Shares closed at about $91 on Friday, but as you can see, with today's plunge, currently now off about 9% or so, we're back below $84. Katie, our televised combat expert, thank you so much. Turning now to technology, tells us first quarter deliveries falling short of Elon Musk's goal. Even though they did come in at a record, shares following down after a host of price cuts led to a record quarter for the stock. Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow joining us now from San Francisco. Ed. Yeah, good morning, Lisa. Both Tesla and Rivian, it's kind of plucky rival lower in this early exchange of trading. Actually, Rivian now flat modestly higher after both of their first quarter deliveries beat expectations. For Tesla, 4,222 vehicles uh, the, the, the above street expectations. But as you said, it isn't enough to keep them at that 50 percent annual growth rate that Elon Musk has talked about. This was a fresh record. And you can see that it is also a gain from the prior quarter where amp output had been ramped up. The concern the street turns its head to is margins because this was a result of price cuts that Tesla had done in multiple jurisdictions, including the United States and China at the beginning of the year. You'll remember that Elon Musk talked about demand running at twice the rate of production in those early weeks of 2023, directly stemming from that price cut. The other data figure that we look to, though, or data point that we look to, is that this was the fourth consecutive quarter for Tesla where production exceeded deliveries. Once again, Tesla talks about a high number of vehicles, particularly Model S and Model X, being in transit at the end of the quarter as the company moves to a more even mix of production across its factories in multiple regions, the United States, Europe, and China. But shares a bit low. You have to remember the run-up in the stock this year, above 60% after what was a difficult year for the stock in 2022. Ed Ludlow, thank you so much. Meanwhile, the warnings for Wall Street are piling up. Chris Harvey of Wells Fargo delivering the latest one, writing, quote, the first quarter will be one of the most unforgiving earnings seasons in some time. It is still difficult to identify the most at-risk companies, but the more cyclical firms could see some of the bigger penalties for EPS week 
weakness. Chris, I am so pleased to say, is joining us now. Chris, let's start there. Why haven't we seen such a real punishment from some of the earnings misses, which we actually did see during the first quarter? Um, Lisa, that's a great question, and, and we're not sure. But at the end of the day, what we are in, we're in a slowing economy. We're staring into a recession. Not, the Fed is not going to bail you out. The economy is not going to bail you out. And if you can't make numbers, it's going to be a very, very difficult period. And it's going to be a very difficult year because typically we see serial correlations with these issues. We haven't seen this big pain, but typically before a recession or before a big slowdown, this is when we start to see things really change. And again, there's nothing that's going to bail you out at this point in time. Not the economy, not the Fed. And at the end of the day, it's going to be a very, very difficult season for some companies. So this is what people thought in the first quarter as well. This is what heading into 2023, the likes of Mike Wilson were saying over at Morgan Stanley. And it didn't come to pass. People say that things yeah. kind of hung in there when it came to earnings. Not that much. Right. Uh, it actually, they weren't that great. Morgan Stanley's Mike Wilson just doubling down over the weekend, saying we see little evidence that a new bull market has become and believe that a, the bear still has unfinished business. So he agrees with you, talking about tech's relative outperformance is really just hinging on the potential for stimulative aspects of the bank assets, which uh, Federal Reserve assets have grown, but he uh, really pushes back against that. So from your vantage point, what will be the key moment, uh, Chris, where people kind of right. realize that weakness actually means weakness? Yeah, so, so a couple of things there, Lisa. The, the first thing I would say is for the last few quarters, we haven't had this stance, right? We think there has been more fear mongering than fact. But now what we have is we had the banking stress of the banking crisis in the middle of the quarter. What we're going to find out, what we're looking for is what companies say. Do they say things were good up until the middle part of March and then things slowed down? Right? So if you go, go back to fourth quarter of 18, right? a lot of companies said, hey, we, we read the newspapers, we see what's happening in the stock market, but the consumer, our end markets were still strong. I'm not sure that's true anymore because you do have a much tighter Fed. We are long in the tooth at this point in time, and you do have real concerns on the funding markets. And the last thing is we have been seeing for a number of quarters margins starting to compress, and we think this is where it comes to roost. This is the period where you really have to, if you can't make numbers, if margins get compressed, this is where you get penalized. And this is the first of what may be several very difficult earnings seasons. Chris, let's talk some tail risks. Is the banking crisis over? The, the first thing I would say is we think the bank, the overall bank industry is very solid, very stable. OK, we think that things are very regionalized and, and probably could have used a better word, but the regional bank situation has stabilized. But there's still some idiosyncratic issues. We are going to see some of that play out during earnings season. But overall, the bank situation is, is in good shape. And, and the Fed has done, the Fed, the Treasury has a good job at, at backstopping things. And things have calmed down. But I don't think that the thing that we're facing and the thing that we fear the most and, and, and the concern that we have is we've crested on liquidity. Access to capital will be a little bit more difficult to come by in the second half of the year. And that's going to have economic effects. But overall, the, the bank space is still in a good space. The banking sector is working. We, we, we expect it to continue to work. This is not the great financial crisis by any stretch of the imagination. But there are parts of the banking space that, that still need some, that, that are still under a bit of stress. It's especially under stress because rates are so high and people are taking their money out of deposit accounts and putting it in money market funds, which we see and see record inflows. To what extent do you see some sort of reduction in credit, this sort of credit tightening that everyone's expecting and eager to get on May 8th with that uh, senior loan yeah. officer survey? How much is that going to really cap how far the Fed right. can raise rates and even cause them to cut? Yeah, so again, a, a couple of things there. If you look at the senior loan officer survey, we've already seen conditions tighten, and this is before SVB. So you would have to believe that, that conditions are going to tighten even more, or, or somewhat more, as we go forward in time. Right? What does this all mean? This all means that, that we're going to have more friction, that the liquidity or the liquidity that we had over the past couple of years, you can't rely on that anymore. And what that means is that risk, for the most part, is probably not priced correctly. And we're going to have to see a repricing of risk because of different liquidities. And the last thing I would say is you, you, you are hearing from the powers that be that we probably need more regulation in the banking space. Regulation and liquidity don't usually go hand in hand. What they're talking about is for some companies, 
raising liquidity, raising capital, and that's going to have an impact on the availability of credit. If you're good credit, you still will be able to get it, but at the margin, it's going to become more difficult and risk-based capital will become more costly. So isn't this just an argument for big tech? And a lot of people are pushing back right now, saying that it's not necessarily interest rate sensitive, yeah. but if they already have sold off somewhat, if there are definitely efficiencies that are getting sort of bled out, and these are not companies that are going to struggle right. to get credit, are they sort of defensive stocks right now? Yeah, um, Lisa, so our price target for the S&P 500 is 4,200. It's, it's 20 times on 210. The reason why we got there, and those are pretty healthy numbers, but what we were saying at the beginning of the year is we think rates will come down. This will be a good environment for growth. The econ economy will slow down. That's also a good environment for growth, and the S&P 500 is a growth index. And, and so the answer is we've wanted long duration. We thought growth would come back. This is the environment that growth does come back in. But what we're seeing, too, is we're seeing some of these longer duration assets really run up in the short term. We do expect to see some pullback. The place that we think is, that's lagged a little bit, not, not a ton, but a little bit, is mid-cap growth. And that's a place where we want, want people to put new money to work. Chris Harvey will be sticking with us. Coming up, we'll hit oil, OPEX cut stoking, U.S.-Saudi tensions. It was definitely designed to boost oil prices. I don't think we're staring in the face of 100. We're certainly flirting with a market which could see uh, a, a more demand in the spring and summer. That conversation still ahead. This is Bloomberg The Open. I'm Lisa Mateo, live in the principal room. Coming up, Stanford finance professor Anat Admati. That conversation at 2.30 p.m. Eastern, 7.30 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. Well, we're coming back now with a uh, report on the S&P Global U.S. Manufacturing PMI. It's a slight tick down to 49.2, which is uh, just below 49.3, statistically meaningless change, but it does suggest that manufacturing is still not picking up in the United States. Same story in Europe, where we saw most of the countries over there, the biggest economies, also in the 40s for their manufacturing PMIs. Question now becomes, how does the ISM turn out at the top of the hour? We are expecting at this point a 47.5, which would be down a little bit from 47.7. That'll be the big number to trade on today. Michael McKee, thank you so much. Tension simmering, meanwhile, between the Biden administration and OPEC Plus. After a surprise production cut, Saudi Arabia leading the way by pledging its own 500,000 barrel a day reduction. The White House calling the move ill-advised and vowing to focus on lowering prices for consumers. Bloomberg's Anne Marie Hordern joins us now with more. Anne Marie, do we have a sense of what the administration's response is likely to be? Well, they said it's ill-advised, and Lisa, this surprise cut over the weekend, Sunday surprise from OPEC, was a little bit of Sunday scaries for the Biden administration. What RBC Salim Cross has said is that obviously these Gulf producers, they are pursuing their own economic interests, but the Biden administration has their own interests as well, and that's keeping a lid on oil prices and gasoline prices. What we could potentially see is they could tap the SPR again. Remember, they have been making this historic taps of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, trying to make sure they can quell an oil price rise that was inflicting on gasoline prices as Putin was invading Ukraine. The other thing you may see, and this would be a lot more political posturing, but there is this oh, no PEC bill in Washington. And what this would allow basically the United States to do is go after countries that are part of this cartel, even suing them. Now, not saying this is gonna get past the finish line, but when you see movements like this, these are the kind of conversations that start to come come up to the surface. Anne-Marie, just quickly here, uh, some people would say that perhaps the U.S. thinks too much of itself in this particular case, that perhaps this is really just catering to China, and it's quite clear in Riyadh that China isn't going to have the same kind of demand for energy that it was perhaps before we really got a sense of what the reopening would look like. How much credence do you give that kind of line of to, reasoning? To be honest, I do really believe this is Gulf producers looking out for their own interests. When you look at especially what's going on in Saudi Arabia, obviously no OPEC minister will come on or leader will say that 
they want higher oil prices, but uh, they'll say they want a su supply and demand. But clearly, this benefits their economies. Also, when you look at what's going on in the kingdom right now, they obviously took a huge hit when it came to the collapse of Credit Suisse. So I truly believe this is more about their own economic interests than trying to play this hand to China. AMH, thank you so much uh, for being with us. Chris Harvey of Wells Fargo back with us. Chris, how much does it change the game that OPEC Plus is cutting production by uh, more than a million barrels a day? I, I think it really does. And, and now the question is, what the, what the Saudis look like they're doing is they feel like they have leverage. And now this is going, going to create a back and forth. But at the end of the day, the, uh, I agree with the other commentator. They're looking out for their best interests. Right? And one thing that came out um, recently is if you look at energy production um, in the United States, 20% of the energy, excuse me, not energy, uh, electricity production in the United States, 20% of it is from renewables, which is, I believe, slightly more than coal. That is something you could imagine 10 and 20 years ago. And so the hydrocarbon space is under pressure, it is under attack. And they're going to do what they think is in their best interest, which may not be aligned with our best interests and our consumers. Well, Chris, do you take from this that oil prices are going to be higher, or do you take from this that perhaps growth is slowing more substantially globally, and that's going to feed back into other right. inputs as well? And Lisa, let me just talk about a big picture. What we think is we think that we're going to have higher lows and higher highs, because there, in the United States, there's a disincentive to invest in supply. And that's going to create a, a difficult situation. The only thing that's going to change is price. And, and so we're going to have a situation where the lows aren't that low and the highs continue to march higher overall. As far as the short term, that's hard for me to tell. But overall, because of some of the supply issues, some of the incentives and some of the policy, you're just not going to have the supply that you want that's going to bring down price the way it has in the past. So, Chris, are you bullish on energy uh, companies just in general? Do you think that those stocks still are really going to be the ballasts? So, so right now we're neutral on energy. We are looking at the pullback. There are a lot of really attractive companies in the energy space. The energy companies have done a fantastic job at, at restructuring their balance sheets, at doing shareholder-friendly activity. And we think there's a lot of value and a lot of quality there. The one issue that we have is we do think we're going into recession. We do think things are slowing down. So it may not be tactically the opportune time to, to get aggressive on energy just yet. How different is your outlook today than it was, say, start at the start of the year when it comes to what's defensive and what's not? Um, not too different. So at, at the end of the year in December, we did downgrade some of the staples because we thought valuation wasn't that attractive and what we thought was going to be defensive sector-wise was pharma um, because of valuation. Um, because of the underlying fundamentals. We also thought that better balance sheets would be more defensive, and, and we, we remain in that camp, and actually, we think that's the place that you really want to be. And, and one of the things I think you're implying is what you're seeing in the marketplace is Uber caps or large cap growth or technology appear to be the new low vol, and to some degree, we understand that, but it's also because when you're in a banking crisis, when you're in a situation where there's stress, you want to have those better balance sheets, you want to have those stable growers, and people have run to that. But it does look like that's a little bit stretched in the short term. But overall, those balance sheets do look pretty attractive to us. On the flip side, do you fade some of the home builder stocks? Um, it's not so much we, we fade the home builder stocks. What we're fading is we want to fade risk, we want to fade cyclicality, and we like growth or GARP over value. We think we're going into a slowing economic environment where credit is going to be more difficult to fund and, and we're late in the cycle. And, and here's the thing that we keep coming back to, right? We're close to our near-term price target. As we look forward in time, it's heads we lose, tails we lose, because financial conditions in all likelihood are going to tighten. They're either going to tighten related to the banking crisis or, or the banking stress, or they're going to tighten because we've resolved that, it's in a good place, and the Fed will get back on its horse and start raising again. And so we're looking at a situation where, where financial conditions, almost no, no matter what, tighten. And that's just not a great environment for risk and, and risk product.
Chris Harvey, thank you so much for taking the time. Have a great week. And now let's take a look at some of the sector action. We've seen a lot in the energy stocks. Abigail Doolittle on deck. Abby. Hey, Lisa. Well, of course, energy is the top sector on the day, up more than 5%. A really classic risk uh, picture here. We do have small gains on bottom utilities, along with some of the tech companies as yields go higher. Relative to energy, it's a seventh up day in a row, the longest winning streak since uh, last uh, October. And we also have, or excuse me, today's 5% pop, the best day since last October. That streak, the best since last March, Lisa. Abigail, thank you so much. Coming up, the market moving events that you need to be watching. That's next in our Trading Diary. This is Bloomberg The Open. Let's take a look at what's going on right now. About 25 minutes into the session, we see uh, the Russell is actually gaining the most, up three-tenths of a percent. S&P up two-tenths of a percent. Still in the red for the NASDAQ, perhaps on the heels of some of the increase that we're seeing in yields, down about a half of a percent. Time now for the trading diary. What you need to be watching this week, ISM manufacturing coming at the top of the hour. President Biden discussing his economic agenda for Minnesota at 2.30 Eastern. On Tuesday, Credit Suisse holding its annual shareholders meeting plus fed speak from cook and mustard followed by uh, bullard on thursday and finally on friday yes it's good friday but it is also the main event uh, the u.s payrolls report to close out the week with potential perhaps for a softening but not that much people still city group among them expecting more than 200,000 jobs created this was countdown to the open this is bloomberg